okay now we are going live Professor Jussi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay, good. So we have already gone to live in YouTube. Okay, okay. Yeah. I just want to ask you, can you follow the my pointer on the screen? Yeah, uh, yes, yes, we can. Okay, okay, okay. Fine. Yeah. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Sure. This will be mobile on silent. Uh, Professor Josie, can you hear me? Yes. Can you, uh, for some time, can you just, uh, you know, uh, uh, show your face because uh, we want to introduce you? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, just, I think, can I make it? Uh... Yeah, just uh, switch up the sharing. Okay. Uh... Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. okay. Okay, so uh, welcome you all. So uh, we are, as you know, as you know already, we are having National Science Day program. And as a part of this National Science Day program, we have, we have organized six lectures. Three of them will be online and three of them will be offline. And today we have the first online speaker. And the, uh, the name of the pro uh, speaker is Professor Jayant Jesse. So he's an assistant professor 
uh, at uh, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. Uh, so he, so the, uh, the title of the talk today is The Sun, a Force to be Reckoned With. So I guess uh, we know a little bit of sun, but we will go into the deeper of sun. <coughs> and we will know more physics, I hope. And uh, a little short CV on, on uh, Professor Josie is that he, he finished his PhD uh, in solar physics from Max Planck Institute of Solar System Research, uh, Göttingen, Germany. Uh, then he moved to uh, Stockholm University, uh, Institute of Solar Physics, Department of Astronomy in Stockholm University, where he did his first postdoc. Uh, and then he moved to uh, Oslo, Norway, uh, so the University of Oslo, where he again did his second postdoc. And then uh, for some time, he also moved to uh, USA, Hawaii, so uh, National Solar Observatory. And there also he worked for a few months. Uh, and at the, almost at the end of 2021, he has joined uh, at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And since then, he is there. Uh, with this short introduction, I want to uh, Ask Professor Josie to continue his work. Thank you. Thank you. For yeah. Thank you. So thank you for uh, this invitation to give a public talk uh, on your uh, National Science Day celebration. Uh, I'm I'm very delighted. Uh, unfortunately, it would be great if, if it would be great if I could visit in person and, and meet people. But uh, unfortunately, for some particular reason, I couldn't uh, come personally. So I decided to give it online. So what we are going to talk today is about the sun and its its impact on on our life on planet Earth. So my my research is mostly related to the sun and solar physics. Not too much about the interplanetary impact of the sun. But what we're going to discuss today is more about the the impact of the solar energy and the solar events on the Earth atmosphere and the, our life, which is now highly technology based, and how the sun can affect on on the time to time basis on the on the technology or the highly uh, our life, which is highly based on the technology. So what I will do is I will just give the general. Uh, introduction about the sun that when we we observe the sun what we see uh, what are the phenomena we see what are the different atmospheric phenomena on the sun uh, on such and then later half of the of the presentation i would uh, go and discuss you know, about the impact of the of the solar activity on the our planet so so th this is the how the the talk is structured so i will i will just briefly talk about how the energy generated i think most of you um, might know about this because I assume that this is the field mostly and then I will go and show a little bit about how what we see in the solar atmosphere how it is uh, electromagnetic uh, different band in the electron we discuss about the solar cycle uh, which is related to the magnetic field generation and the magnetic variability on the on the sun and then in end which is the 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 core of this presentation is that how the how the solar activity for example flares and the coronal mass ejection affect the, our near earth environment and the man-made uh, systems and technology <laughs> So as as you know that uh, the the sun actually uh, energy is generated in the core through the fusion and the helium is it has a hydrogen burning core and and mass basically is turned into the energy and this is how the all of the energy is generated uh, in in the sun and the ninety nine percent of energy basically is generated in this twenty five percent core of the uh, sun and then at a time actually it burns uh, six ten to powers eleven kg of uh, hydrogen into the helium nuclei every second and then uh, in turn which is basically three point seven ten to minus thirty eight uh, protons are converted into the helium nuclei. So this is basically more not so much in detail but a detail uh, nuclear fusion reaction. So you see that four uh, protons are basically converted into the helium. Uh, atom and then because the four uh, the helium atom is lighter than the four protons so that remaining mass is basically converted into the energy through the mostly through the gamma rays 
and and that and total energy is basically 26.7 mega electron watt per helium nuclei and which is and the, rem the remaining mass is basically radiated through the gamma ray radiation in this process there are also neutrinos are generated and actually the photon which is generated in the core which basically go through the random walk and they are repeatedly ab absorbed and re-emitted and then go through the Brownian motion and, and their mean free path is actually very small at the core. So it is 0 0.01 centimeters. So you can imagine that to moving at such a distance of the solar radiance, it would take a tremendous time uh, time to, to escape the solar surface. And that is around 10 to power minus five uh, years. So this is what you see the structure. So this is the core and this is the radiative zone. And these arrows here are shown this is the random walk of the photon. Then outer layer is the convection, convection zone which is shown by these arrows. The internal structure generally is if you see the temperature from the radius. So this is bottom x-axis is the radius with, with respect to the total solar radius. So one is the solar surface, zero is the core. And what you see is the change in the temperature. So the core temperature is around 14 million Kelvin and it's slowly reduced toward the, toward the surface. And it's is go to the effective temperature of the star in the end. And the mass and and then you see the gas pressure. Of course, the gas pressure is also very high at the at the center, and it and it decreases uh, very quickly toward the surface. And then if you see the mass, so mass is basically given as a respect to the mass at a particular radius with respect to the total solar mass. So around almost zero point seven or something, it almost reached close to the to the one. So most of the mass is basically toward the core, and it's become more and more lighter when you go in the outward toward the solar surface. So sun in the number, I would I would read out some number. It might be boring for you just to just get an scale and, and the size and energetic of the sun. Just to get that idea, I will just read out the some number. So mass is actually around 2, 10 to minus uh, kg, which is considered as a one solar mass. And in astrophysics, which is this is the, the unit which has been used. And the, and the radius is around uh, 7, 10 to minus 5 kilometers. Average dens density is 1.4 gram per centimeter cube, which is almost one third of the density on the on the Earth, and the core den density is much higher. Effective temperature is around like 6,000 Kelvin. Uh, core temperature I told already is like 15 million uh, Kelvin, and the surface gravitational acceleration is around like 275 meter per second square. And other numbers are, for example, it has a like 4.5 five to minus nine year age and the, of course distance which is astronomical unit uh, and then the composition composition wise the it is uh, 90 percent hydrogen 10 percent helium and the remaining uh, uh, metal uh, are actually less than one percent uh, so it, it has a differential rotation so sun is doesn't rotate as a whole is a, is a plasma body so it doesn't rotate uh, the same way so core actually uh, the equator rotate much faster and then the the, the poles rotate uh, slower so equator rotate around 27 days and then the poles are around maybe 33 or something like that and then also it doesn't the, it, it also it's not the surface which is rotated differentially but also with the depth the rotation is different and that is has a important consequences to the magnetic field generation and the dynamo on the star uh, yeah and and the one arc second measurement is around 720 kilometer on the on the solar surface. So if you observe the spectrum uh, from the sun, so this is what we get actually. So uh, yellow one is observed outside the solar atmosphere. So it looks like very close to the blackbody radiation with the peak around 5,700. Uh, Kelvin, but when we observe from the sea level, so a lot of at atmospheric uh, absorptions happens. Uh, so a lot of molecules absorb the light, uh, and then you see that you are not able to uh, absorb the whole envelope of the electromagnetic radiation clearly. So the best observation you can, uh, if you want to observe through the whole electromagnetic uh, spectrum, you have to go into the space. Uh, so now the sun is actually atmosphere has divided into multiple layers. So it's called the, the lower most uh, uh, layer, which is photosphere, where the where the photon is able to escape uh, uh, from this uh, from the star is called the photosphere. And the photons below that layer is not it is trapped into the in, into the star. Uh, and then on top of that, the layer comes the chromosphere, and then transition region, corona, and the heliosphere. So density on the stars uh, drops exponentially. Uh, so 
for that particular, if you assume the, the isothermal temperature, then the pressure height scale in the photosphere is around uh, 100 kilometer. And that is why you see when you make a white light image of the sun, it, even it's a gaseous body, it looks like a, a solid sphere. It has a very sharp boundary because the pressure height scale is very small. So this is in general, if you if you want to uh, uh, characterize sun as, as a one dimensional temperature stratification. Uh, so this is how the temperature changes in terms of log logarithmic of the temperature. And this is how the temperature changes with the geometrical height. So this is the surface and then the temperature started decreasing around like 500, 600 kilometer. And that is what temperature minimum. And then it's come the uh, chromosphere. So different layers are defined like this, photosphere, chromosphere, transition region, and the corona. So in the chromosphere itself, temperature started rising slowly, and then it suddenly shoot out, and that is called the transition region, and its name actually explains that suddenly from a low 10,000 to 20,000 Kelvin temperature, it suddenly drops into the million degree temperature within the very small layer of the uh, atmosphere, and that where in the corona reached the temperature up to 2 million Kelvin in some places even higher than that. But this, of course, the sun is highly structured. So this one dimension, uh, the, this temperature stratification in geometrical height uh, maybe is good to give a general idea, but it is not true everywhere on the, on the sun. So mostly when you talk about the solar atmosphere, you talk in terms of the temperature. Uh, so sometime it might happen that some location, that transition region where the temperature is shooting out to the million uh, or 2 million degree temperature, uh, Kelvin temperature, it might be pushed down into the lower in atmosphere. In some cases, it could happening into higher in the atmosphere. So generally, the solar phase is referred to the solar atmosphere, mostly in, in terms of the temperature and not in terms of the geometric. So this is, I want to show that when you observe the sun on the different layers, how, uh, what, are, what kind of features uh, you see. So this is the, this part of the atmosphere, photosphere. And when you observe this, you usually look like a very uniform body, but then you see this small, small dark uh, patches appearing and disappearing, rotating with the solar surface. And those are called the sunspot. And they, are, they have a strong magnetic field, which will come back to it. And then if you observe in the high resolution images, you see the granulation and granulation is basically the small scale convective cells. And then also you see that this, uh, the, when you look at the disc, it looks brighter. And then when you go toward the core, it looks darker. And this is called the deep uh, limb darkening. And this is just basically a radiative transfer effect. So you are looking at the limb at the more raising angle. So you are crossing the more of the atmosphere. So same number of photon are absorbed in the higher layer and because the temperature is increasing, decreasing with the height, you see the layer where the temperature is lower in the atmosphere. So that's why you see the variation from disk center to uh, limb. Then you go to the chromosphere, the, the scene change a little bit and you see that there are a lot of sunspot. You already see that you see this dark sunspot here if you follow my cursor, but then you also see that there are also elongated dark features basically and they are the cooler plasma. Uh, suspended into the atmosphere and they are cooler than the surrounding uh, region and the same features when it appear on the, so these are called the filaments and the same feature you observe when close to the limb, uh, you see as a bright structure and prominence and they also at the same layer you see the flare. So if you focus in this part, you see the sudden brightening at certain point in this location and this is the uh, solar flare. So you see it here, for example, it looks like a structure emerging. And then if you see here, then you see that they are brightening here. And these are the same feature which are the dark, but because now the absorption, they are just emitting. So you see that there's no background and it is emitting. So you, they, look, they, they look like a bright thing and they are, have a different nomenclature, but they are the same thing. They are called the prominences, but they are the same thing what you see as a dark structure on the surface, uh, which is called the filament. Then you go to the higher, uh, uh, layers, for example, in the transition region, it looks like uh, this, which is around, say, 10 to the power, uh, 1000, uh, 10 to the power 5 Kelvin, and it is observed by the SOHO satellite. Uh, compared to the earlier image, you might find that there's no structure, much larger structure in this image, which is just because this image is taken during the solar minimum, which will come to again in the upcoming uh, for the, in the in the next slides, so during the when the activity is minimum, magnetic activity is minimum, then the features are are less, and that's why it looks uh, mostly uh, featureless. Although you are able to see the prominences in this this directions, and then 
we go to the solar corona, there is a this satellite, which the images I'm showing now is from the particular satellite from the NASA. This is Solar Dynamic Observatory, and it has a many different filters. For example, here are the listes, uh, listed uh, filters, and fil these different filters actually cover the different uh, emission lines. Uh, and then because this emission line form in the different temperatures, so they basically sample the different part of the atmosphere. So for example, if you go to this 160 nanometer, it is carbon four line. So temperature is around 10 to power five Kelvin. Same way, if you go to the, for example, uh, 171, which is uh, uh, iron line, and that is 6.3, 10 to power five Kelvin. So different, uh, different, for example, this is iron 18. So temperature is, little higher, uh, so uh, different layers because different filters uh, cover the different emission lines. So they sample the different temperature in the corona. So, sorry. Uh, yeah. So now I'm just showing the one particular filter, which is has a, a carbon four. It is temperature around 10 to 5 Kelvin, but it also has a, some cooler component around 5,000 Kelvin. So what you see again here is the sunspot. And then you see the lot of bright structure. So bright, bright sunspot are the dark, the strong magnetic field structure and the bright region you see actually, they are also magnetic structure, but they are weaker and the smaller in the size. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the chromosphere, which is 50,000 Kelvin, and the transition region, which is this layer where the temperature started rising. And then you see the lot of structure and dynamic filaments, prominences, uh, look like structure and very bright structure. And this, this bright structure are corresponding to the, in the photosphere corresponding to the uh, sunspot and the active region. So the bright structure basically on the solar surface are called the active regions and the regions which doesn't show a lot of brightening uh, show more of the uniform, relatively uniform structure, those regions are called the quite sun. And then you go to the 171 nanometer filter, and there the temperature is 10 to power minus 5 Kelvin, and then you see the lot of loop-like structure in the corona. So these are the magnetic loop, and you see the lot of brightening. Again, these are the corresponding to the magnetic activity on the solar atmosphere. Then even you can go to the higher temperature and 10 to power 6 Kelvin compared to the earlier image you saw this to this, you see the only few places which has a, this high temperature 10 to power 6 Kelvin. Although there are one to one correspondence in terms of the features. So you can using the different uh, emission line in the atmosphere or the different spectral line, you can sample the different layer in the atmosphere. And then sun is a magnetic star so everything has to do with the magnetic field so this is the magnetic field in the photosphere so what you see is the dark and the white patches so what the white patches mean is the magnetic field is pointing coming out of the solar surface and the dark patches mean that magnetic field lines are going back to the surface right so these are the you see the active zone which is for example plus minus um, 30 degree latitude and you see that there are a lot of sunspot. And if you go back to the images you've seen before, and the most of the region you see have a very bright structure you see in the coronal temperature, they have a strong magnetic field in the photosphere, okay? So this is how the generally you, you see when you, you observe the uh, sun as a, as a resolve the whole disk and see in the different temperature in the different filter. But if you have a big, telescope and you, you put now into the very limited high resolution field of view. So you are not observing the whole sun, but you're observing on the small page with a big telescope. And this is what the photosphere look like. So it is basically granulation. So these are the convective cells. Uh, so the, the bright features are basically the hot plasma coming up and the surrounding dark region is basically where the cooler plasma after it ready to cool down, the cooler plasma actually goes to the edges and, and go back to the surface. So these are the bubbles of the convection. And then you also see that it is it is a, actually, by definition, it is a quiet sun where there's no large scale uh, magnetic field is there. But if you look into the magnetograms, which is a polarization measurement here, so you see that their magnetic field uh, on the very small scale are actually organized um, on the surface. But now you see that this doesn't have a one-to-one -one correlation with what you see in the, this granulation pattern. So you see that this, patches are organized in the bigger cells. And that is also a underlying convection cell, which is deeper in the atmosphere, but bigger in the size. So 
uh, there in this particular photospheric surface, the magnetic, uh, the gas pressure basically dominant over the magnetic pressure. So what the gas pressure does is that it advects the magnetic field lines toward the bigger convective cells and they are concentrated on the edges of that bigger convective cell. So you see that they are organized in much larger pattern compared to what you see in the granulation. And then you look at the sunspot from the big telescope. So you see that as you see that there's a two structure, you see the dark central core, which is called the umbra, and you go to the surrounding, which is called the penumbra. Penumbra has a, this very filamentary or very organized structure, filamentary structure, which is radially directed. Uh, so the, it has a sunspot has a strong magnetic field in the, in the average uh, sunspot, the magnetic field can go up to three. Uh, go, uh, three kilogauss and the, even the bigger sunspot it can go up to 4.5 or 5 kilogauss also. And so field is very strongest in the core and that actually prohibited the convective uh, energy and transport so that's why it looked a little darker uh, and then the, this is surround, uh, surrounding annular area which has also magnetic field which is on order of 1.5 kilogauss to 1 gauss but then the convection and the magnetic field interplays and that is actually the inclined magnetic field which make this convective cell uh, elongated so this is also still a convection but in presence of the magnetic field so their form actually is distorted into it's not very symmetric and it's become elongated. Now, if you look into the <clears throat> now, if you look into Corona with the high resolution telescope, then you see the scene from the photosphere has completely changed. There, you were looking at the mostly at the granulation, but now you see that there are a lot of dynamic structure which are changing much faster on the order of few seconds, and you are able to see that there is a flare in this part. You see this is flare happening here, and these are the called the fibrils. So they are tracing the now the magnetic field line, which is emerging from the solar surface and going back. And also they are tracing the magnetoacoustic shock waves and MHD waves, which I'm, we are not going to discuss in this talk, but they are the uh, manifestation on, on MHD waves and the acoustic shock waves and the magnetic field lines. Now, if you look at the, I, I, I showed you this in the HL5 images, that dark uh, filamentary structure, which is called the filament. And when you look into the edges of the chromosphere, then they are look brighter on the limb. And this is the high resolution image of the one of the prominences. And you can see the how fast the dynamics are there. You see the all kind of uh, uh, zigzaggy motion of the plasma. The, you might also see the really tailor instability at some places, and you see the King oxidation. So, in using these images, you can study the magnetohydrodynamic waves in the solar atmosphere very nicely. But the solar atmosphere, it shows that some solar atmosphere is highly structured. It is not a uniform thing. Now, even you look into the chromosphere, and then you see that there are these jets. You see that there's a needle-like, very narrow things are, and this cadence of this image would be around ten seconds. So, they are very fast event, which are. Uh, plasma jets. So they are again manifestation, either the reconnection jet, magnetic reconnection jet, uh, or the uh, MHD waves. And the same thing on the limb here, you see as a bright. So these are the same structure we, you see in the disc, they are absorbing uh, on the on the surface and most and the, and the, on the limb, you see the mostly the emission. So that's why they are look brighter, because there's a no background intensity. Now, if you look into the corona in the high, high resolution image, what you see here is the mostly the very structured loop. So these loops are basically magnetic field lines. It doesn't mean that the magnetic field lines are only there where you see the loops. Magnetic field lines are also there where it is dark region, but some, some particular region, these magnetic loops, which are bright, are filled with the hot plasma. And that's why they are called the coronal loop. So definition on the coronal loop that they must be filled with the hot plasma. And these coronal loops are the building block, block of the corona. And the loop temperature can range from 0 0.5 million Kelvin to 10 million Kelvin. So just some fact that how do we know that the, the corona is heated to the million degree uh, temperature. So there are some uh, element discovery done using the solar observations. So uh, helium was discovered in 1868 during the eclipse. And, the, and af after that, the new line at uh, 530 nanometer was observed during 1869 eclipse. So this line was not identified before. So first it's interpreted there's some unknown element which exists on the sun and they name it coronium. And then after almost, uh, say, uh, 70 years or, or so, uh, that then the Gorten and Banked 
1914 identified that this is oh this is actually highly ionized iron 13 uh, line and to to ionize the iron 13 you need very high uh, temperature or a lot of energy and that energy if you convert that is around 10 to power 6 uh, kelvin and so the, then it it concluded at that time that the corona has to be very hot because it has a highly ionized uh, species and then you look into the sunspot. I, I showed you the sunspot, how, how, how they look like. And if you trace the sunspot and their number, so they vary with the time, almost very systematic way. So you see that on the top, this is the from the 1880 to around 2020. And you, if you count the number of sunspot on the solar surface, then they vary with the 11 year cycle. So you see that they go to the peak maximum and then go to the almost zero, not completely zero, but very, very few. For a, for a few year time or a year time, they are very few and then they go again to the maximum. Although the peaks are not uh, same, so the, 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 the number of sunspot at the solar maximum, so this is called the solar maximum, this is called the solar minimum. So the, the peaks are not the same and they vary, but the period is kind of um, you know, similar around 11 year solar cycle, but the, the pole actually changed the polarity on the 22 years. And that is has to do with the solar dynamo. Again, this is not the scope of this presentation to discuss the solar dynamo, but the pole say, assume that at certain particular uh, solar minimum, it has a positive polarity. It would take 12, 22 years to back to the that positive polarity after 11 year, it will switch to the negative polarity. And that is uh, magnetic cycle. So magnetic cycles is exactly double of the sunspot cycle and it takes 22 years. And if you follow the sunspot, their position on the solar surface in terms of the latitude. So this is latitude. So this is the beginning of say, so this is the beginning of particular solar cycle. The sunspot basically appear on the higher latitude around 30, 35 degree. And then this slowly mi migrate toward the equator basically. And that, that is a famous butterfly diagram. So this is the position of the sunspot varying uh, through the sunspot cycle. Now it's come to the flare, which is basically um, very important for the uh, for the, the, the discussion in, in this talk, which is the space weather. So I would play a movie and you see that this very energetic plasma ejection and the brightness enhancement. So flare is basically observed in all part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum from say the gamma ray to, to radio and the white is cloud flare because in certain region on the on the surface suddenly there is a enhanced uh, intensity increase and it is very sharp increase and then is gradually decreased so there is a sudden intensity increase and then you when you image it then they look very dramatic so for example the here you see this very large flare so plasma has ejected and you see the brightness enhancement then you would see the another flares in the another filter, for example, here, this, you see the plasma ejected and some of the plasma is not able to escape and it fall back onto the surface, this dark features, this another flares, which is very impulsive. So the flares are very impulsive within the few minutes, they will show the brightening. This is the flare on a, in another. So you see the multiple flares in this uh, movie and these are the called the flares. So the flares, the biggest flare could have energy of 10 to powers 32. Arcs, but the smaller would have a, uh, uh, a smaller go around 10 to power 27. So they categorize the flares depending on the total energy release. And some of these flares also related with the coronal ejection, which will come into the next slide. So here are the classification of the flares depending on the usually done on the X-ray flux. So here you see that the X-ray flux measure between uh, 1.0 to 8.0 angstrom, the red one. So this is the time and this is on particular few days duration and then this is the flux measured in watts per meter squared. And then if it reach in certain uh, scale, then it is categorized as a, a, B, C and M. So A, a are the very small flares. So for example, here, and then the X class are the largest flares. So if it is more than 10 to power minus four watt per meter squared, then they are classified the uh, X class flare, and these are the most energetic flares observed on the on the solar atmosphere. Now comes the uh, coronal mass ejection that is also related to the flares. So when the flare happens and the flares are basically a disturbance into the solar 
magnetic field uh, this is uh, you see that there's a large uh, scale structure which is called the flux rope which ejects from the solar atmosphere during the flares not all the coronal mass ejections are associated with the flares but most of them are associated with the flares so i would play the movie so so first you would see a flare so this white so this is the coronagraph image and the corona is several order uh, magnitude fainter than the, the disk light so that's why when you want to see the corona in the details you have to occult the the solar disk which usually in the natural way happen during the eclipse but when you want to observe it regular basis then you have to artificially occult it so this is the coronagraph image the white circle show is the disk of the sun and the flare happens somewhere at this location where the marker is, which we will see in the in the disc uh, movie. And then after that uh, flare, you see that large uh, blob of the plasma is ejected from the solar surface. So this is the flare location you see, and the sudden brightening you see here. And after some time, when this uh, disc image is replaced by the coronographic image, then you see that there's a sudden uh, ejecta of the plasma blob into the corona and that is called the coronal mass ejection. So by name, it is clear that it is basically mass is ejected to the corona. Now you would see that at this location, in this direction, you see this ejecta of, ejecta of the plasma. So this is the uh, coronal mass ejection. So coronal mass ejection actually tra could travel from 20 kilometer per second to almost 3000 kilometer per second and on average coronal mass ejection could carry around 10 to power 12 kg of uh, mass, which is in terms of the solar mass very small. Uh, so you see this another CME. So coronal mass ejection is taking. And then the sum of many big CME actually can travel into the interplanetary medium, crossing the all the inner uh, planets, the outer planets, going up to the almost edge of the solar system. So now we will talk about the, how this flares and 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 the uh, and the coronal mass ejection can impact the uh, solar uh, uh, the the weather on on the Earth and this is what called the space weather. So uh, now I will switch uh, the tone of the presentation and it would be go into the more of the historical way that what was the, how it was discovered and how the impact first impact of the solar activ activity was discovered on the on the Earth and then I will go into the uh, the advanced uh, current knowledge about it. So already in in the 17, 1700, uh, people were aware about the auroras. So this is the some sketch from the 1839 from the, of the Aurora Borealis in the Finnmark. I think the Finnmark is the northern part of the of the Finland, and there uh, it was uh, it is observed more. It is close to the pole, so it is observed more frequently there. So this is the sketches from somewhere around 1839. So you see this structure here, this white structure, and they also has a lot of structure vertically. You see and different layers. These are the basically earlier observations of the auroras in the north, around the North Pole. Hmm. And nowadays, if you observe it, it looks like this. For the modern day camera and modern day technology, if you image it, you, it, look, it looks like this. So this is also again observed somewhere close in the Scandinavia. So it has a lot of structure. You see the, all the wiggly, wiggly things here and a lot of fine structure in here. So aurora actually doesn't just appear into the green light, but sometimes it can also appear into the, the reddish purplish light and sometimes also into the blue. So basically uh, it is ionization of the of the atoms or the molecules in the in the ionosphere by the high energetic particle from the sun, which actually excite the, the electron from higher energy level. And when it de-excite, it would emit into the particular wavelength and then the, mostly the green and the reddish light is coming from the oxygen and the bluish and, and the hazy red color is basically coming from the nitrogen. So this is the just images, but this is the movie taken from the International Space Station. So from the beautifully, you see the from the space, uh, International Space Station that the vertical extent of the of the aurora. So you see that at, at, at a, as a very bright, nice, beautiful layer of the aurora and the multiple colors as well uh, on the atmosphere so this still this is aurora you see here and this is taken from the international space station like that okay so yeah so you see a lot of so this is a very big aurora on the polar region and you see this circular uh, aurora cap here for example this one like that okay so 
then people in the beginning has started try to connect it with something that why we see this aurora and then already in 1850s they able to connect it with the geomagnetic storm so what is the geomagnetic storm so geomagnetic storm is basically uh, perturbation observed large perturbation observed in the earth mag uh, magnetic field using a magnetometer so this is a q uh, observatory magnetometer uh, in london observed in 1859 and you see that there is a, this is the magnetic field observed and you see there is a sudden uh, uh, variation in the in the magnetic field and those mag variation in the earth magnetic field are called the geomagnetic storms so people were already in the 1850 were uh, uh, were able to to say that okay the aurora are somehow related to the geomagnetic storm so whenever they observe the aurora they found that there is a perturbation into the earth magnetic field and then, then around 1852, by the advert, it was kind of very well established that the solar cycle, the solar cycle, as I told earlier, that is the variation in the sunspot number. Of course, this plot, what are, where you are seeing is basically a modern day plot comparing from 1865 to 2005. So this is not the plot from the advert, but this is the modern day plot. But he already in 1852 uh, find out that uh, the mostly the, it is the, whatever geomagnetic storm you observe, they are corresponding to the sunspot number so if there's a more activity on the solar surface sunspot then there's a chance of observing more geomagnetic storm so what you see the red curve here is the sunspot number so this is the solar cycle variation 11 year and then the blue is the number of geomagnetic storms observed okay so you might wonder that oh there is a there is a lot of more actually in the later in after like uh, 1925 but you have to remember that the accuracy of measurement in early uh, 19th century must be very low and the most of the magnetic field measurements were done almost all of the magnetic field measurements were done from the ground but now the most of the magnetic field measurement are done from the space in situ measurement uh, mostly in between the sun and earth line around the Lagrangian point l1 so this give you the best uh, direction in sun earth line to observe the, any disturbance in the earth magnetic field so then you would be able to observe more geomagnetic uh, storms and then it's come to the flux flare observation. So around uh, 1859, around September 1st, the, the Carrington, Richard Carrington, who was actually a amateur uh, uh, astronomer who was not a professional, but he had a, uh, his own uh, laboratory and telescope where he would record the sunspot and draw them on a very regular basis. So he kept a record, very detailed record of the sunspot. Uh, every day whenever it was possible and one day what he found so what you see is the sketch of the sunspot sunspot group so as i told you earlier that sunspot has a, this dark central part so this dark patches you see here is the umbra and then it's surrounded by the penumbra but suddenly he found that within the sunspot this is extremely bright uh, bright thing so you see that the kidney beans kind of structure here like mark as a b and also like c and d he suddenly found that there's extremely bright patches he observed uh, he drew it as well but he he, he was not uh, sure that uh, it, it was an artifact of his his measurement or his telescope uh, but later he confirmed that it was a real thing and at the same time there was another observation which found this brightening actually and this was the kind of first flare observation uh, done um, around first september 9, 1859 and the same time the Q Observatory in London, a day after, day later, they found geomagnetic storm. So what is, as, as I explained again, geomagnetic storm is the disturbance in earth magnetic field. So just after one day, they found that there is a sudden, you see that the sudden change in the earth magnetic field, and then it's gradually recovered from it. There are the missing measurements somewhere here, but you see the sudden drop into magnetic field and then it's gradually recover in, I think, two or few hours or sometime a day or so. So then they're able to kind of connect, okay, you observe something on the solar surface and then you see the geomagnetic storm. So uh, auroras are associated with the geomagnetic storm and geomagnetic storms might be connected with the activity happening on the solar surface. So there's there the first indication that, okay, whatever geomagnetic storm you, able, you are observing on the, on, on the earth, earth magnetic field is basically might be connected to something happening on the sun. And, and, and then at that time, same same event actually, which is called the Carrington event, it was also observed that there was a, a weather monitoring uh, observatory, I think in the Kolaba, uh, Bombay, and they also observed this uh, sudden variation in the magnetic field. So this is from the Kolaba observatory. 
directly on the on the I think September two change in the magnetic field. So this was there are multiple record. It was not just just one one observation. There were multiple record on the same observation which show that okay they saw something bright on the on the sunspot which looked named as a flare or Carrington event. And then same time you saw the disturbance into the Earth magnetic field. Not at the same time, but with some delay. Okay, a day or or, or at least few few hours. And then the later people collected that uh, because there was a geomagnetic storm, there must be aurora been seen. Uh, so later people has collected all the data or record of the where people has observed the, this auroras in 1859. And Herkawa in 2008 published a paper. So he showed the, all the, this uh, blue dots and the red dots are the sighting of the aurora in the August, September 1859. So you see that mostly the auroras are observed in the polar region, but you see that in this particular event, it almost close to the uh, plus 20 degree or plus 30 degree around in the Southern Mexico, uh, North America, you see in the close to the like Chile and in the in the North, you see in the Russia, of course, you see in the Europe, but it also observed in the, in the Australia. And that was the basically this this September one to three event was called the Carrington event because it was recorded by the Carrington as a as a flare. Uh, but uh, before a uh, few days before it was not recorded. But then also there was a, this uh, aurora sighting was observed and this was almost similar similar geographical location. Also some places in the earlier it was some places in China as well or Japan uh, and same geo uh, same same latitude earlier also two three days before this aurora sighting was observed so this was a kind of a very big solar activity which was observed on many different latitude aurora was observed on many almost close to Texas and below that actually so there was a very big uh, solar storm. So then uh, how the things people were not still able to explain that, okay, you saw something on, on, the, on the sun and then you see the geomagnetic storm and that is connected to the auroras, but what exactly happening in terms of the physics? So uh, then in 1897, JJ Thompson discovered the electron. So there was a now a particle uh, who would carry the charge. So that is a very imp imp important addition into the, this story or tale of the auroras and the geomagnetic storm and the solar storm. So this play very important role, the discovery of electron. And then in 1900, uh, Christian uh, Brickland, who was a Swedish, uh, uh, Swedish scientist and who he used to go to the polar expedition and observe the aurora, he did a laboratory experiment, which is called the Terela uh, ex ex experiment, where he actually had a, a magnet, which in the shape of the sphere. And then in the vacuum, he, he bombarded with the electrons. And he would see that the electron would glow around the polar region. For example, you see here. So, uh, so then he actually kind of anticipated that the, that the auroras may be caused by the electron coming from the from the sun. Of course, he didn't call it electron. He called it some positive and negative charge, which is basically or rays, not even the charge, positive negative rays. And what does it probably he mean is that it was both electron and ions. And then, until then, it was not known that the sun is a magnetic star. So actually, George Ellery Hill in uh, around 1908 observed the first time, observed the magnetic field in the sunspot. And how did it observe? See, so actually, he observed the, the particular spectral line. So this is the sunspot, and this is the spectral line. And you see the spectra. So this is spectral line along the slit. And at, as it go through the through the sun, you see that it, the spectral line has broadening. And this is basically the Zeeman broadening. So Zeeman effect was already discovered and he interpreted this directly immediately that sunspot must be because the, you see the clear broadening in many sunspot observation. This must be the sun. Sun is basically, sunspots are basically magnetic and in general, the sun is a magnetic star. So this is also very uh, important uh, uh, connection between the story of the uh, of the space weather and the and the solar storm and plus the geomagnetic storms and then in 1921 there was another event happened and then it was very highly uh, uh, appeared into the media in the print media in USA and uh, you see that this clipping so for example in 1921 it called the sunspot created with real tie up. So what happened in the central New York that the, all the communication and the signaling system in the New York railway was completely disturbed. And then they immediately connected 
that that this must be a, a important uh, things related related to the northern lights so uh, the title is the new york central signal system put out of service by the play of the northern light same time uh, the, uh, the in the paris actually they found the electric disturbances in the french wire and that they did not observe the aurora at that time, but then they attributed it to the, some atmospheric condition. Maybe it was cloudy or something. So they were not able to observe the aurora, but they observed this um, disturbance in the in the electric wires. And then they said that, okay, this must be related to the uh, solar activity or the aurora. Same way, the, the, the another title appeared that sunspot aurora paralyzed uh, wire. So there's already people were able to connect that, okay, something happening on the auroras which basically lead to the disturbance into the electronics or the electric system. And then come the discovery of the, the ionosphere. So Edward who was uh, given the Nobel Prize in 1947 for his, his work on the ionosphere. And then he, uh, he, he, and then it is found out that there's a layer in the upper atmosphere which where the UV lights basically causes the ionization and then there's a plasma in that upper layer in the ionosphere. And then basically this is also used for the uh, radio communication. So low frequency wave would reflect in the lower in the atmosphere from the ionosphere and the high frequency wave, higher frequency wave will reflect, travel further more in ionosphere and then the reflect back from the uh, upper atmosphere and, and the even higher, the high frequency will pass through the solar atmosphere. So this is also play an important role in the story of Aurora. Then in, 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 in Chapman in 1933, he, he could not give the exact interpretation that was happening, but he kind of uh, as, uh, imagined that there must be a something, a plasma coming from the solar flare, which is basically disturbing the Earth, uh, Earth magnetosphere, Earth magnetic field. And then it must be connected with the ionosphere, which basically give the aurora. So there's this, that idea was already given by the Chapman in 1933, although he would not able to explain that what it is that which is basically pushing the magnetic field line toward the day side. Uh, then comes the, the famous uh, Eugene Parker, and he actually theorized the, the solar wind. So solar wind is basically a escape of the highly... Uh, a supersonic uh, charge particle from the solar atmosphere. So, 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 so as I said, the corona is million degree temperature. So most of the corona is actually kept by the, the solar gravity, but because some of them has a very high energy, they would be able to escape the solar atmosphere and travel in the interplanetary medium. So when they interact with the solar atmosphere, so you see that the Earth, Earth magnetic field has, has a asymmetry. So in the day side, it is pushed. And in the nighttime, it has a tail like shape, for example. So basically the charged particle, which is pushing the magnetic field line toward the day, uh, day side. And also it's making the, when it's going in the night side, it's make the tail of the, of the um, mag magnetosphere. So it's called the magneto tail. So that solar wind actually uh, is important part. So this is a charged particle and that charged particle can also enter into the solar atmosphere coming from the solar wind. So this is the this is the movie which actually show that how the the charged particle from the this, this is an animation how the charged particle is basically reflected by the uh, sorry uh, Earth atmosphere. So this is Earth and this is the charged particle coming from Sun and you see that Earth magnetic field is basically deflecting the uh, the charged particle and then they make the tail in the in the night side, for example. So. So, we are, so then already until 1916, there was a, some understanding what is the space weather and what is mean by the space weather is what is happening in the ionosphere and what is creating the auroras. So uh, at that time, what already knowledge was there is that the sun is the sun has a magnetic field and it has a uh, cycle, 11 uh, year sunspot cycle, uh, and then which is 22 year magnetic cycle. Already at that time was known as the solar corona is million degree hot. And that million degree hot solar corona, some particle would escape with the supersonic flow and that is called the solar wind. And then it was already kind of people able to make a connection that large flare actually sometime can disturb the ionosphere. And then also the radio communication, which I didn't show that at already at that time when in the field tower, there was a, a radio antenna, which would do the 
uh, transoceanic uh, radio communication with the Northern America, and, and, and they would form some correlation that whenever there was a high number of sunspot, the communication was disturbed or, or broken. So they were able to connect that, okay, there's something on the sun which actually affect the, the radio communication in and basically radio communication is affect, affected by the changes in the ionosphere. And then this is already was known that sun is surrounded by the magnetic sphere. And then the geo geomagnetic storms are correlated with the flares uh, with a time delay. So it, it, you will observe the flares on the on the or on the solar surface, and then after some time, maybe day or two, you will observe the geomagnetic storms, or sometime even longer, depending on the speed of the of the, the material moving into the uh, one AU distance. And then it's come the first observation of the CME. So there was a radio observation in the millihertz so you see that these are the disk of the solar disk and then you see the radio uh, radio intensity observed so you see that this is the earlier time this is after that and this is later that so you see this they observe that there is some brightening which is basically traveling away from the solar disk like this and if the track you track with the time so the, this is the disk basically and this is the position of the, this blob observed in the 80 millihertz frequency and then it is traveling fast away from the sun and earlier before that they observed something in the h alpha that something plasma is ejecting from the h alpha chronographs there's something ejecting from the surface so they able to connect it that something ejected from the surface and traveling into interplanetary medium hmm. so in then the, the general definition after all this uh, basic initial knowledge that what is the space weather is basically uh, this is the magnetic eruption from the uh, from the sunspot or the solar surface and that which triggered the series of events so solar flares so this is the high energy photons ionizing the planetary atmosphere and the coronal mass ejection ejecta of the magnetized plasma which we showed in the earlier slide that in the 80 millihertz image nowadays most of the observation i showed earlier that come from the white light chronograph where you occult the uh, the solar disk which is very bright and then you nicely able to see the ejecta of the plasma uh, magnetized plasma, which is known as a coronal mass ejection. And then after a few days delay, the CME would, co if CME collide with the Earth magnetosphere, uh, to be more specific, if the, the magnetic field of the colliding uh, CME plasma is opposite to the Earth magnetic field, then it would do the magnetic reconnection, and then the geomagnetic storm would take place. Hmm. The magnetic reconnection now taking in the day side would push the magneto tail and the magnetic field line from the both uh, uh, on the magneto tail from the both both poles would again reconnect and then it accelerate the charged particle toward the polar region and that is how you get the nighttime auroras so i would play a movie uh, here which basically would summarize uh, the whole uh, the most of the thing i said in the previous slide so this is might be one or two uh, minute uh, movie with an audio so i would play it now this is where the tail of the aurora starts. On the sun, a star of average size among billions of other stars in our Milky Way. The sun acts as an enormous power plant. The energy is created deep inside the core of the sun. Here the temperature is over 14 million degrees and the pressure is so enormous that hydrogen atoms are squeezed together into another element, helium. This nuclear reaction releases energy. The light radiates outward from the core of the sun. In the outer layers, the heat moves to the surface in huge eddies called convection cells. These electrical currents of charged gas create magnetic fields inside the sun. In some places, strong magnetic fields push their way up through the surface. They slow down the eddies of hot gas. The surface cools and darker sunspots appear. The electrically charged gas is called plasma. The plasma drags the magnetic field further upwards. The magnetic field stretches and twists like a rubber band. Then the rubber band breaks. Several billion tons of plasma is hurled out from the sun. This is called a solar storm. The solar 
thunderstorm can reach speeds over 8 million kilometers an hour. After six hours, it blows past the planet Mercury. So this is how the general uh, general idea of the how the, the auroras are happen or the how the geomagnetic storm happens actually. So then this geomagnetic storm or the storm from the sun also can affect the earth in the many different way. So for example, it can basically produce the ionospheric current. It can damage the spectro uh, spectrograph, uh, spacecraft electronics by the uh, depositing very high charge. Uh, it can also affect the, the aviation uh, uh, and then also it can, for example, it will affect the ionosphere and then your GPS signal would be inaccurate, for example, and uh, it can also affect your uh, telluric current in the, in, induce the telluric current in the pipelines under the sea and then it can also affect the submarine cable. So it is a charged particle in the atmosphere which disturbs the ionosphere and it can uh, affect the, the life technology on the many different ways. So, for example, it can also induce the very high current in the in the electric grids. So it can fail, uh, and it can also affect your radio communication because it is radio communication is done through the ionosphere. In our ionospheric condition are changed, then your radio communication communication can be can be disturbed or or, or can be disrupted very significantly. So then I will show the some of the example in the in the past century or, or more that how the how the space weather uh, event has impacted uh, life on the earth so this is the basically a 2003 halloween solar storm and uh, what you see here on the right side here is the uh, composite aurora over the europe so this all the red thing uh, yellow patches you see is the basically aurora happened in the northern uh, sweden and norway and also part of russia i think uh, and then what is, this is the in-situ measurement at the L1. So what you see in the bottom, this green, red, and the black is the different component of the magnetic field. So for example, BX, BY, and BZ. So in Cartesian uh, coordinate, and you see that a certain time after the flare happens. So this is the X flux of the flare. At certain time, the flare happened here. And after some time, there's a geomagnetic disturbance observed in the, in the Earth's magnetic field. And that led to this 2003 Halloween uh, storm in October 28, 29 in 2003. And so what happened during that Halloween, uh, that the effect on the ground basically, so satellite based system and the communication were affected. Aircraft were advised to avoid the high uh, altitude near the polar region because this would be affected more. And there's a, there was a, a one hour long power outrage in the, occurred in the as a result of this solar activity. And <clears throat> Aurora were actually observed uh, in the very lower latitude as far as the Texas and the Mediterranean countries in the uh, Europe. And then there was a 12 transformers in the South Africa were disabled and had to be replaced despite the country's low uh, uh, magnetic latitude. So even if it, it, it is South Africa is so lower in, in the latitude, it, they, they had to replace 12 uh, transformers due to this event. And then in space, actually the SOHO uh, satellite, which is a, basically a satellite to study the sun. Uh, and there was an instrument, which is a advanced composite explorer, which is basically uh, do the composition of the plasma at the L1 position was damaged. 
by the solar activity and then there was numerous other spe spe uh, spacecraft which were damaged and they experienced the downtime due to the various issues. Uh, some of them actually was intentionally put down because uh, just to prevent the damage. And then the astron astronaut on board the International Space Station had to stay inside uh, into the Russian orbital segment, which was better protected uh, against the increased radiation level. So this event actually, after that Carrington event in 1859, this is the event which had a largest impact and then you can imagine also in during within that one 150 year or so the technology we, our life has become more and more technology dependent and in 1967 actually it, it gave a nuclear war alert because the radar uh, civilians radar uh, in the northern parts for example in the alaska and greenland and uk was suddenly uh, jammed and they thought okay, this is related to the, some nuclear attack uh, from the Russia, we, and they have jammed the, the radar system, but immediately, because that time it was already known that, that the communication system can be affected by the solar activity, there were solar astronomers who said that, no, 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 this is not a nuclear war alert, and this is something related to the solar activity, so this is the image <laughs> from the solar surface, and you see this small, big brightening here, and this is the basically solar flare happened before that nuclear war alert in 1967. And then there was a, this Quebec uh, power back out. Uh, it was a March 1918 geomagnetic storm. So I think almost for several hours, the Northern America was out of electricity. Uh, and you see that there's a burn transformer uh, in this image in the Quebec power station. And then the latest thing you, you might already know is, the, is the, that in the February 2022, almost this is the news clip from the India Today, and there was almost 40 Starlink satellite was completely lost due to the geomagnetic storm. And this was M1 class flare happened on the sun, I think a day before or so. So you can see that how our how the life on Earth can be affected by the by the activity on sun. So sun is a force which we have to consider uh, while when our life is highly dependent on the technology. And then Aurora is not uh, specific to Earth. You can also observe on the other planet. So for example, you, you can already observe on the Saturn and so you did this Aurora here and then also in the Jupiter and Saturn both. So this is end of my talk. I will end up with this flare movie here. So yeah, I'm open for now questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Joshi, for this interesting talk. And also the, the pictures and the videos were excellent, actually, I have to say that. Uh, so the talk is now open for questions. So if you have any questions, please come ahead and ask here. Yeah. From here, uh, no, you have to come. Yes, so I just had a quick question regarding your like uh, the videos in the solar player that you are showing uh, mm -hmm. towards the big yeah uh, initial part of your talk. So it yeah. looked like like something was rotating so fast. Sun is so huge, but yeah, uh, not this. The when you were showing the full sun and uh, some images. Uh, this one? No, it looked like like it's rotating. Uh, yeah, not this one. Maybe some of the more initial. Uh, okay, so these are the first two movies, and yes, this one, this one probably something we are talking about. No, when you showed the full globe, the full sun. Ah, okay, full sun. Okay, yes. okay. Yes. Okay, something yes. like that. Why ah. it looks like so? These are like real images from satellite, or like yeah, these are the real images from the satellite. Yes. Now, uh, why from... does this look like it's rotating so fast? The so star. Yeah, so so this is this is not the real uh, rotation. So you can uh, see the time very in a small font. So this is yeah, but they are like in days, right? So yeah, they, that is in days. So for one yeah. one complete rotation. So if you observe the one particular active region going from here to here, it would take thirteen days. The what? Thirteen days. Thirteen days. Yeah. Thirteen, 13, 13 days. days. You can see that. No, but see, it's like really fast, right? Days are showing us. Yeah, no, I know. But compared to the sun size, it's like too fast. Like, so in 26 days, like you are having this rotation? One, one, three days. From here to here. 
going any any feature rotation is on the equator. So the rotation on the equator around 27 days to complete I one see. rotation it takes. Yeah, yeah. So that matches with the okay. yes. Yeah. Any other questions? How much is the size of the sun granules? Actually, I was not able to understand that scale you provided no. there. Okay, okay, okay. So granules, the granules are around thousand kilometer on average. Of fifteen hundred. Average size, average size thousand kilometer. Thousand to fifteen hundred kilometers on size. So this patch you observe here would be around, uh, say, uh, forty uh, megameter. 10 to the power six. Capital, yeah. capital M, small m. It means mag, megameter. Megameter. Yeah, yeah capital see. M. So 10 to the power six kilometer from here to here. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So the so yeah, my, uh, there there would be millions of of the granulation on the surface at any given time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, Professor Joshi. So I have a question that in the initial slide you showed that most of the energy generated at 24% of the solar radius. What is the reason? Yeah. yeah, so this is basically come to the stellar structure, right? So uh, you need a density to basically overcome the Coulomb uh, collision, right? So hydrogen burning would be uh, mostly into the core where it is very highly densely packed and a lot of energy there. Now, so, why this 24%? 24% it is come from the standard model of the stars. So you uh, fit the model in terms of the, what is the, which zone, this is theoretical. So observationally, you cannot prove that this is 24%, oh. right? So uh, this this is because the interior you cannot observe, right? So you just look into the fit your, your so you have a certain, you know the radius of the star, you know the luminosity of the stars, you need to know the outer parameters, and then you try to, fit your theoretical model using the standard model and that would give you the what is the width of the uh, relative zone what is the width of the convection zone and what is the uh, what is the diameter of the or radius of the core for example okay so another question is that uh, does the solar play some effect on temperature of the earth yes uh, so so whatever temperature we have of, uh, we found into the into the modern era in after the industrialization the most of is basically is by the humans so the, there, there could be some effect from the sun into the, to earth atmosphere but the effect from the from the greenhouse gases is such a large effect that uh, you cannot quantify that is small changes through the sun so there if you if you know that around uh, long back there was a period when there was called the monitor minimum for almost for 80 years there was a solar activity was very low and that was uh, people call it that it was a mini ice age kind of a thing. Then the northern Europe or the even the southern Europe was completely freezes, and the temperature <laughs> record at that time suggests that the global average temperature was plunged by around one degree to one point five degree. Only that much, okay. And in the modern in the modern era, in the twentieth and twenty first century, or even the nineteenth century. Most of the temperature changes we observed is just because of the global warming of the greenhouse and gases and the forcing from the sun is very small. So I, it would be very difficult out of that uh, greenhouse gases to find out what is the effect of the sun on the change of the temperature on Earth. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I have basically two questions. So you showed yes. the picture of sun with different filters and the color is basically changing. So what does that mean? And uh, I mean, and the second question is that whenever you look into the optical, uh, like the spectrum from the sun, in what mm -hmm. unit you measure, like in absolute magnitude or like in volumetric magnitude, like what is the way that you measure? Yeah, so when you measure the electromagnetic radiation, Basically, I'm answering the first question, uh, the second question first. Whenever you observe the electromagnetic radiation, you can observe exactly in terms of the energy unit, right? So radiation in terms of the energy unit, you can directly measure. So uh, that is you measure the electromagnetic radiation. And then when changing the uh, filter, different filters is basically because as, as you see here that 
the solar atmosphere temperature is changing with the geometrical height and if you're observing with the different filter color are the false color okay for what whenever you observe the images on the ccd or the or the detector it would be always black and white to so just the beautifying the things we put the colors but what it signify is that different features has a different temperature in the atmosphere so for example I show you this. So this is 6.3 n to minus 5 Kelvin. And you see that there are a lot of bright feature here. And if you go to the little higher temperature, then you would see that a lot of brightness has decreases. It's only restricted to the sun area. So you could say that the very hot corona is restricted to the limited area, which is like 10 to power 6 Kelvin compared to the 10 to power 5 Kelvin. So one order of magnitude difference. So what you could say in general look looking different feature in different filter is the corona is not uh, isothermal is a multi-thermal multi plasma even at the one location in your line of sight see what, what you're observing is through your line of sight right in the depth in the in the solar atmosphere so some position you might observe the some uh, two million kelvin temperature and some location you might observe the less than a million uh, degree temperature so these are the mixed multi-thermal plasma you observe and for the second that whether it is measured in absolute magnitude or is absolute magnitude yes 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 you can calibrate that okay. thank you uh, so uh, what are the possible uh, like uh, physical processes involved uh, for the sudden temperature increase from this photosphere to the outer layer of solar corona? So like it's yeah. uh, almost like 10 to the power two order of temperature difference. Yes. So uh, this is the big uh, problem, which is the big problem in the solar physics, which is called the coronal heating problem. Uh, I, if I would have an exact answer to this question, I, I would have actually solved the biggest problem in the solar physics. But the, I could I could tell you the the uh, proposed different theories. Okay, so one of the famous theory, which was also uh, put forward by the Eugene Parker, is that magnetic reconnection. Okay, so you see this flare. So flare is also basically magnetic reconnection, whereas the part of the magnetic energy dissipated into the thermal energy and the kinetic energy and the acceleration of the uh, particles, charge particle. Now, these are large scale reconnection. So there is a proposed theory that there might be millions and billions of small scale reconnection happening everywhere on the solar surface, which would actually convert the magnetic energy into the thermal energy and that would hit the corona to the million degree temperature. So theoretically, it is possible. Another possible thing is that waves. So as you know, that acoustic wave, uh, I'm speaking and the mechanical energy is, is fed into the, into the acoustic wave and is transferring energy from one place to another place. So there are mag magnetohydrodynamics waves. So magnetohydrodynamics is basically the, the, the plasma fluid motion in presence of the magnetic field and that would generate a lot of waves. And those waves uh, could carry a lot of energy from the lower in the atmosphere going higher in the atmosphere. And if somehow they dissipate energy at particular height in the atmosphere, that could also possibly uh, hit the, the corona to the million degree temperature. Now, the, most of the people are, until we, the things which is not figured out very well, that how would this uh, waves would dissipate energy at particular height? What would be the dissipation mechanism? And that is still an active field of research. <coughs> Okay, so uh, on the continuation of that, uh, another question is like, uh, recently I've heard that Parker probe was launched to uh, uh, like observe some parameters of the sun. So uh, in that case, uh, is it possible that it, it would also study about these hydrodynamical processes to understand the heating of the solar corona better? Uh, it is it is difficult. The purpose of that probe is that probe is not taking the detailed images. What it's doing is doing the in situ measurement. So it might observe the, some fluctuation into the uh, into the solar atmosphere because it's going very close to the solar surface. But I don't think that it would be able to solve the, this particular uh, uh, problem, the coronal heating problem. So it, 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 the purpose is to do the in, in situ measurement of the corona going close to the solar surface. But in my opinion, maybe some other scientists might be disagree, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it would be able to solve uh, this particular problem. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, then let's thank the speaker again.
Thank you. And also thank you, Professor Josie, for uh, this immediate response. I think we contacted you like uh, 10 days ago. So yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you yeah. for that. So, yeah. I, I, I also apologize. I was traveling and I was in the Kodaikanal. So we do this winter school in Kodaikanal for the solar physics every year. So I was organizing then. I just returned from that trip. Uh, so otherwise, I would else I would like to to be in person in in, in Dhanbad in IIT Dhanbad and uh, maybe sometime in future. Yeah, next time, next time of course. I mean, we will we will we'll of course organize such kind of uh, events like seminars or also this this kind yeah. of event. So we'll definitely in one of these they definitely will invite you. Thank you for thank that. You. Thank you for it. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very delighted.